and it's the view view function it's people who are maybe folks So if you just want to see center thingy right now, one of you push the speaker, speaker view option. All right. Let's do And there's one thing I like to talk about. And In that, that is case. Thank you. City being here with us. In that email, there was Alrighty, and I'm turning it over to you. Alright. Cool. Alright, everybody. Welcome. Am I centered here? <laughs> I don't mean centered like, mm, but, you know, centered in the camera. Um, coffee's got me totally not centered. Welcome. Thanks for um, coming here today and uh, watching this demo on loose watercolor birds. Uh, hopefully, this, you're going to find some some information of value. Um, thanks to Opus for having me here today. It's always a pleasure to come and share um, for my local and favorite art store. So um, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, yeah, it was just mentioned as far as some teaching things go. I'll just get that kind of stuff out of the way. I do teach locally quite a bit. I teach out of the Shadbolt Center for Arts. Fine arts instructors there. I teach even more locally over in White Rock. Um, I do some stuff online for Winslow Art Center out of Seattle. And over the past year, I've slowly been building up some content on a Patreon account, which I do have a, a, a address for at the bottom of my window there. Um, I do monthly demos on there that range from about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, I think there's probably 12 or 15 different videos. It's not all birds. There's other things on there as well um, actually it's it's pretty cool and I'm probably gonna drop this video up in there as well so it will live on somewhere past uh, this live demo today but nevertheless let's get going here um, I'm going oh yes Sue thank you very much Gibson Squad. I would have mentioned that I sorry, I just saw this in chat I'm teaching at the Gibson School for the Arts this summer um, so doing a workshop there starting next week, uh, which I'm very excited about. So it's kind of a concept for a course that I've wanted to do for some time. Just a grab bag. I do a lot of birds. I do a lot of landscapes. I do a lot of urban sketching. Um, I like to share a lot of information on theory and technique. So I'm doing a big grab bag workshop of all the things I love over the course of four days up in beautiful Gibson's BC, um, starting next week. So gonna be fun all right um, so yeah let's get going here with this demo um, hopefully you can all see everything here I've got a little line drawing down here of a nut hatch that I'm going to paint and get a couple of pieces of paper here so I've got some things to do some color swatches on here and I'm going to get rid of me because that's not Thing anybody wants to look at for too long so get rid of that and we will replace it with image of the nut hatch I'm gonna paint um, so I'm going to just shift a couple things around here so I can see things a little bit better and 
hand, I'll talk very quickly about what I'm going to be using here. So um, I really want to get right into painting. Um, so the drawing that I have, uh, most of my drawings when I paint things like birds, um, I try to keep them pretty loose so I don't do an awful lot of detail. I tend to focus mostly on the overall silhouette of the bird, including a few things like the edge of a wing, some, you know, directional lines for primary feathers, and, you know, fairly obvious markings that are specific to the, the bird that I'm painting, right? So with respect to the nuthatch, you know, I've got this definite mask around the eye. Um, here's my wing edge there, very distinct nuthatch shape, um, along with their beak there. So those are the things that I generally focus on. Um, and the other thing is when I do my drawings, I do my initial sketch with, with pencil. I draw very lightly, generally using a 0.5 mechanical pencil for most of my drawings. Um, use a little Pentel 0.5 graph gear here. I also like to use the P5 by Pentel. Well, I like the size of lead because if I apply too much pressure, it snaps. Um, and I intend to draw quite lightly because I will eventually erase most of my sketch and replace it with watercolor pencil. Um, so all my silhouette outline, except with the exception of some details I don't want to lose in a wash, I do all my redrawing with a watercolor pencil. It will dissolve for the most part into my painting. Um, I just use the one. I don't try to match color. I actually don't mind a little bit of the, it's, it's like a, somewhere between a burnt umber and a sepia, this particular hue, it's called walnut brown. Um, I kind of like the little bit of a color fringe that it introduces into the washes. So I use a watercolor pencil for the drawing um, in addition to the mechanical pencil. And then you'll see me get to, when I get to the eye and finish off the eye later, I use uh, a couple of pastel pencils. I like to go in and create a little bit of depth into the eye. It works quite well. Uh, and then main brushes. Uh, I generally work with about a 12 size brush and an eight size round. I will vary between standard rounds and I will also use um, calligraphy brushes. Well, uh, unfortunately, one of my calligraphy brushes has seen an awful lot of use and abuse over the years. And until I can get a new one, um, just the hairs just keep coming out of it. So these are what I would use quite regularly. But I'll be using standard rounds today, even a Skoda Versatil. Um, and then I also use a small round synthetic uh, just for small little details, things that I can't really get into. And then I will also, you'll see me use a fan brush. It will help me get some texture. Okay. So let's start talking about some things here. So loose watercolor birds, I mean, I'm not really after, what, what does that mean, I guess? I'm not really after just, you know, dropping paint around, letting it flow all over the place, that kind of thing. I am to an extent, but I tend to paint my birds in isolation like this. I don't, you know, I don't generally draw the feet. I don't include what they're standing on, where they are, all those types of things. I am really just focused on the form of the bird, the shape of the bird which I think nut hatchers are great because they always have this, well, not always, but you know, generally um, when I get images of these birds, they've got this nice little arc to them when they've got their feet planted into the tree. It's got a really cool shape that I, I quite like to paint and draw. Um, so I'm always interested in you know, some type, like traditional focus in a painting where you might have like a background ground, foreground, you're going to put your subject somewhere in there. So even though I have just one subject in isolation, I tend to think about it similar to this kind of foreground, midground, background kind of idea. So that means somewhere in this shape, I'm going to want to focus. And then I will treat different areas of, the, of this subject differently 
as I would maybe in a landscape. So it's always going to be the face for me. I'm trying to, you know, bring the viewer to this area. So I will do a number of things that allow me to stay loose in other areas. So I'll include a little bit more detail around the face. I will do some additional things with uh, different textures in and around the eye. But as I move away from the head, I tend to go less detail with the paint, you know, to even less detail. And as far as values go, even if the reference has things very dark near the tail, I tend to progress values up towards the face as well with my darkest values being in and around the facial area. All things that I feel help bring the viewer's attention up towards the face. So keep some of those things in mind as I'm, as I'm working through this bird today. Um, they're, they're always things that I'm thinking about. And I guess kind of in a nutshell, I'm always focused on shape, value, and texture. I mean, those are, whenever I put a brush stroke down or even with a, a, a line with the pencil, I'm thinking, how is this adding to the shape? You know, is it adding to the value? Is this adding to texture, right? And also, I take that word adding uh, just a little bit further. And is it adding just for adding sake or is it, you know, is it adding in a more positive way? Is it enhancing the overall look of the painting or is it just simply going to be um so things to things to consider so let's get right into this um i'm thinking what i'm going to use for a brush here so best choice is always kind of the biggest brush you're comfortable with for the area i'm probably going to stick with uh, an eight i think probably for most of this painting um, seems to be about the right size. How much time do I have, Pamela? Can like an hour? Is that about right? Okay. okay. I just want to make sure that I don't run off on a tangent, that's all. I want to stay focused. I'm easily distracted by butterflies, so... Or in this case, oh, maybe a butterfly. <laughs> All right. Um, so when I go through the the uh, painting process uh, with watercolor, even with a lot of other things, I'm always moving lights, middles to darks. So with respect to this bird, you know, I thinking, okay, well, where are my lighter areas? Those are going to be the ones that I'm going to want to paint. Um, watercolor, right? We start with our white. So we want to do our best to try to preserve the whites that we want to keep. So starting with that idea in mind, right, this, this makes it a little bit easier to save some of the whites of our paper. So the lightest areas I'm going to have in here. Oh, you have a question? Um, and the problem that I've got with that is going to create a wealth of issues because the camera is fixed focused. Right? If I bring it up, it's going to be blurry. And then they'll complain about that. See? Yeah. I have seen some people mention that it looks blurry. Are you seeing it as blurry, Pamela? Because I'm not seeing it blurry on my end. Check my... Uh... Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to get moving here. Okay, so for the most part, 
there's not a lot of colors um, in this bird, right? We're, we're dealing with a real nice complementary palette of, you know, a bit of an orange and a blue. So it's real nice, natural harmony handed to us on a silver platter. Um, so I'm going to be dealing with, with oranges and, and blues for this. Uh, and when I say oranges, I probably should have just said orange. And more specifically, when I think about color, I tend to think, you know, what is the hue? Is that hue warm or cool? And then more importantly, is that hue bright or dull? Um, so, you know, you could have all sorts of oranges in your palette. Um, but one of the ones that, you know, you, I get a lot of use out of when I'm painting birds are the more muted oranges, like your earth oranges. Is the word I will often use for, for the orange in my palette, which could be like burnt sienna, an acridone burnt orange, or in the case of what I'll be using today, right here is my earth orange well. I'll be using burnt sienna light by Daniel Smith. Um, it's very similar in hue to burnt sienna. It's just it doesn't have any of the, the it's um, way less granular than, than burnt sienna and more transparent. So I tend to favor paints that are more transparent and I, I don't know. I would say in the last few years, I've sort of lost my taste for granulation. Um, the unavoidable and a lot of blue pigments with the exception of phthalos. But uh, for all my other paints, I, I try to choose things that, that aren't, that don't have a lot of granulation to it. So mixing up just a little bit of water here. And then I'm going to just pick up some burnt sienna light here. And for the reference, um, for people's reference as well, with your saying that the drawing is really light, I mean, I, I don't draw very dark. I draw very light intentionally. Um, especially when I'm using the watercolor pencil. I really just want to see, I only, I actually I've drawn it a bit darker than I normally would for myself. So, um, but I generally draw very light because I don't mind the lines being there, but I like them to be as minimal as possible. Okay, so I mix up a little bit of value and I just check it out and see how strong that is. And I mean, always, if anything, check your value, right? I've been painting for years and I'll still, I still check it. A general recommendation is if you're going to mix up a value and you're not sure, err on the lighter side as opposed to the darker side. Because watercolor is very easy to add more value to, not so easy to remove value from once it's down on the paper. Um, Okay. So let's get moving here. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to grab just a little bit of earth yellow as well. So a bit of yellow ochre. And I'm just going to take a little bit of that very light yellow ochre. Not a lot, just a tiny little bit. I'm really just looking to color the paper. So I just put a little bit in. This is one of the types of brush strokes that I'll use quite often where I just lay down a little bit of paint and then just quickly come in and soften that whole edge so it disappears. And all this area, the left of it, I'm not too worried about because I know I'm going to be going in there with some darker value for that other part of the bird. Now, what I'm doing is now just bringing some of this water down into the lower area of the tummy here. And then I'll start picking up some of my earth orange, bringing that 
into that area. Now I'm going to turn my paper a little bit here just so I can move my brush a little bit more how I like to move it. And I'm trying not to keep an awful lot of paint in the tip of the brush. That way it just allows me to lift a nice little wispy mark at the end there. And then I'm going to drop a little bit more pigment just up underneath. Back here. Now I'm going to do one more thing in a moment here, but I'm just going to clean brush, just going to come back here and just soften up some of these edges. I'm that list that um, Pamela just put up, mentioned earth orange. Earth orange is what is essentially my um, burnt sienna light. I mean, it is my burnt sienna light. I'm just going to use a little fan brush, a little bit of water in it. I'm just going to drop a little bit of water into the bottom here. While it's kind of damp, just bring a little bit of texture down to the bottom. And just out. So for the first wash in the lower area of the bird, that works out pretty well for me. Sometimes it depends. I might actually have a little bit of neutral tint on hand and I'll drop a little bit in the bottom. Um, but I'm going to be focusing primarily on getting a nice line down through this wing. Um, so I may go back in here and add a little bit of value later, but for now, I think I'm just going to leave it like this. Now, I don't want to paint. I'm always trying to be very aware of what I have painted recently so that I don't just go in, paint next to it, and get a bunch of you know, paint leaking everywhere. So I don't really want to, there's not really many places I can go into right now because this whole area is still on the damp side of things. But what I can do while I'm waiting for some of this to settle is I can go into the eye area and put a little bit of paint in. Now the eye, it's, this is one of those, you know, brown eyed birds. Um, so I would just use, if I had burnt umber in my palette, I would just use that pretty good color for brown in a, in a bird's eye. But what I end up using is either a combination of the same earth orange I just used with either neutral tint or I'll use like a sepia or a Van Dyke brown or whatever I've got in there for kind of a dull dark. Van Dyke brown would work. Sepia would work. I could also just use neutral tint. I'm really just trying to take a burnt orange or an earth orange hue and pull it into the wheel, and make it a little bit duller because burnt umber, um, sepia, Van Dyke brown, they're really just duller versions of earth orange, right? So with a neutral tint and uh, earth orange, you really could get your burnt umbers and that kind of stuff. Gonna check that value. Right. Not too strong. Small brush. Because what I want to get in 
is the eye here. So I like to use a nice small brush. I don't like to make this too dark. I like to have some room to build value into the eye later. So I don't, you know, a lot of images you'll see of birds, the eyes look really dark. And I mean, the natural tendency, I think for many, including myself for a long time, is you look at a reference and you're like, okay, well, I guess that's what it's supposed to look like. So I'm gonna just do that. But that doesn't really bring anything to the table as far as, you know, your vision. You're just looking at a reference and going, okay, I'm gonna do that. Um, I read somewhere recently that uh, artists translate and other people transcribe, right? So transcribe is our process of recreating the exact same thing. Um, where as an artist, we kind of want to see things, process it through our own voice and translate it into something that's potentially visually new or you know, more to our tastes. It means you have a lot of freedom when it comes to that kind of idea. Maybe you want to you know, do colors a, a different way, you know, that sort of thing. Lots more room to play and create something more unique, right? So I just put a little bit of brown in there and let that sit. And what I'm going to do real quick is grab my hair dryer and just dry this whole thing. So the water I've dropped in has had a little bit of chance to settle out. And I'll just let that go. So one moment here. a bunch of comments about neutral tint it's it's pretty common right Windsor Newton has one Van Gogh paints has one Daniel Smith has one Holbein it's um the main reason to use something like a neutral tint would be um to just take the saturation down off of colors that don't have a naturally dull version available right so like earth yellow it's naturally dull compared to say a Hansa yellow medium or a Hansa yellow deep, that sort of thing. Um, get a you know permanent orange or a translucent orange um, colors, but earth orange is gonna be naturally more dull. Um, but neutral tint, you can take that into a lot of different other hues and you can create a more neutralized version of it, a duller, less bright version of whatever hue. So that's one way that it can be used. You can also use it in mass tone for, you know, something akin to a black. That helps. All right. So, um, did, were you about to ask me a question, Pamela? I heard you talk. I was just wasn't shutting up. Oh. <laughs> Right, exactly. When I, when I teach, I give people the option whether they want to use neutral tint or something like Payne's Gray. Um, it's just the important thing between those two is, number one, it's a convenience mixture. So there's no, you know, recipe available on the internet that all the makers follow and produce the exact same results. Neutral tint is a combination of a bunch of different pigments. Uh, same with Payne's Gray. There's no like Payne's Gray pigment. So you'll find that different producers have a slightly different shift in the hue um, for the, their convenience paints, Payne's Gray or... Um, so it's a good idea, whatever you're using, to swatch it out and have a look at the overall hue shift of it. I find... You know, neutral tint tends to be a little bit more neutral, if not slightly red, um, where Payne's grays tend to lean fairly cool towards the blue. 
And it's just good to know that so that if I want to use, say, a Payne's Gray, which I have used in a pinch, if I run out of neutral tint and a student's got some Payne's Gray and it's like, here, do you want to use this? I'm like, fine. I'll just swatch it out really quick, note if it's a little bit to the blue, and then when I use it, I'll probably pull it a little bit more neutral with a bit of earth orange or some other complement to blue. Right? Okay, so we're gonna move into the bird here now. Well, we've already moved into the bird. We've already been working on the bird. We're gonna go in the upper part of the bird and start dealing with some of the complement here. So I'm gonna keep that orange around because I may use it again. Now, when I um, think about color i mentioned this already i go you know what's the hue is that hue warm or cool uh bright or dull right so when i'm going to the upper area of the bird i'm taking a look at the blue in the area of the bird i'm saying well okay it's blue right so that's the answer to my first question what's the hue uh and then i'm going is it warm or cool right so warm cool blue for me so warmer blues tend to be the ones that lean towards red in my opinion so like your ultramarines, indenthrone blues, um, those tend to be some of the warmer ones, you know, heading towards uh, violet, that sort of thing. And then the cooler ones tend to be the ones that go towards like the phthalo blue green shades. I don't think if you go a little bit further, you're going to be into like turquoises, things like that. Those tend to be the cooler blues, in my opinion. So I look at a blue like this and I'm like, okay, what? am I thinking about for, you know, the back of this bird? And I feel a couple of things in there. Like it almost feels a little bit, you know, towards violet down in the lower area of the, of the wing here. So generally it's a bit of a warmer blue. So ultramarine would be probably a better choice. Now that's really as far as I go. I, used to sit there and you know fastidiously mix color and put it up against a reference until i got the exact hue these days i can't say that i really care to do that anymore uh, i just go for an overall gist what's this color saying to me and i will just respond in kind and just choose what i think it what it seems like to me right based on those those three questions what's the hue warm or cool bright or dull so I'm gonna go with a little bit of water here and I will always start with water whenever I'm mixing. Reason, main reason being is it's the easiest way to control and make sure that I have the right amount of paint for what I'm gonna be painting. Um, because the last thing you wanna do is run out when you're in the middle of doing a wash. And I tend to like to make sure I have more than enough. Um, again, like I mentioned, uh, you can mix the value up perfectly the first time, that's awesome. And sometimes that happens. But if I'm going to lean any which way, it's going to be a lighter. So I will often mix double what I feel like I'm gonna need for painting a particular passage. That way if I need to go over it, because you know, you know, so your paint's gonna shift, right? It's gonna lighten a little bit as it dries. So if I need to go over and add a bit more paint, um, having extra of that mixture is going to come in handy. So there's a good amount of blue there. Um, and what I'm going to do is, so remember, what's the hue? Warmer, cool, brighter, dull. So if I look at this right away and I look at the blue on my swatch. I mean, it's okay. Right? I could get away with this. It's not going to be bad. It's not like a, some sort of neon super saturated blue that would just, you know, maybe kind of weird. Um, but it is a little bit brighter than what I'm kind of getting from the reference. So here's a key place to use a little bit of neutral tint. Now I know this is neutral tint over here. So I'm just going to take a little bit of neutral tint and I'm just going to introduce it into the ultramarine. I'm not putting a ton in there, just a little bit. And what it does is just kind of takes a little bit of that brightness off of the blue. And that's all I'm looking for, right? Just a little bit.
Now, overall, that value is a little bit strong. So, when I'm painting birds, I generally envision kind of light coming down from the top, regardless of, of the reference. Um, so, I do want a little bit of a lighter value towards the top. Back here, we head into some wing, um, some tail and lower parts of the wing information really right in here, what I'm interested in right now. So I'm going to take just a damp brush and I'm just going to, actually I'll probably turn just to make my life a little bit easier. And I'm just going to introduce some water along the top here because I could make a second pool of blue and dilute it. That would uh, give me a lighter value of blue. Or I can just introduce a little bit of water onto my paper and then put this blue into it. And then the top part of this wash will. So it also gives me an opportunity to kind of work along my line. And then I just get the excess water out of there. And then I can pick up my blue. I can just run this into. If I go over that, that's no big deal. And then we're just going to bring this down and around. Now, I am getting a bit too much white there. May bring a little bit more. All just been painted, so it's all good. As long as you're moving quickly, be fine. There we go. Now, I wanted this to be a little bit lighter, so just with a slightly damp brush, I'm just going to try and pull a little bit of value off the top. There. And then I get all this moisture out. Roll the moisture on my brush. to drop a little bit on the bottom edge. Should feather up. And then I'm going to drop some water right into there. A bit of it. Break up. And now this little extra batch of dark neutral that I just kind of pulled, neutral tint. I keep saying dark neutral just because that's what I'm used to. I'm just going to use some of this down in the bottom area here. And I might need a little bit more, a little bit thicker. So and a consistency is another thing to think about when you're painting, right? How thick is your paint? Bringing some value in the bottom around here is kind of what I was talking about earlier where I was going to start trying to build a line down this bird. And that's what this is going to help. Now 
There we go. So it's a little bit lighter feeling along the top, a little bit of value building down through, and I've introduced just a little bit of texture into the back. Uh, I might just kind of keep an eye on that as it dries a little. Because I think I want to put just a little bit more water. Great. Area there, just let it break apart a touch. So that'll sit there and settle out for a moment. And while that does that, what I can do, always, you know, watching, watching. <laughs> I'm thinking about Monsters Incorporated. Always watching. Anyways, um, it's grabbing a pure black. I keep a little lamp black down in the end here. Um, and small brush again. And what I'll do is just, while wow, this is settling out here, is just pop into the pupil. And just set that up, right? The iris has had time to dry. So I don't have to worry about it leaking and making a big mess in there. And, you know, I always just use a nice small brush, a little sparkle. Leave a little catch light in there, so those little sparkle. So we got some nice value setting up there. Now the other place that's got a little bit of blue in it is the beak, right? It's not too dissimilar to the value that I've put in here. It is a little bit duller. Um, so I'm gonna go primarily to this little pool on the right here. That's got kind of more of the um, dark neutral than it does the blue. And I'm just gonna use a very light mixture. I'm just going to go into the beak. The main value is primarily in the top. Got a bit of a color in the top of the beak. And then it off white bottom. Still is a little bit of. I'm going to put a little bit in there. And then just clean my brush. Just soften the whole upper area. That same technique that I used in the very first application of paint. Find that I, you know, once you paint enough, I mean, there's lots of, in any watercolor book, there's tons and tons of different things. But really, what it comes down to is just getting really competent with a handful of techniques. You can just lean on those. Because uh, it's really going to be 90%, 95% of what you're doing. Basically, a handful of things. And then the rare occasion that you're going to need something a little bit more specific, right? At one point I thought, I'm going to learn every single technique. And I mean, I learned a lot, but I mean, I've forgotten a whole bunch of them because I just don't use them. So, okay. So it's looking pretty good, right? See if I tilt this a little, you can see it's still a bit wet down in the bottom of the wing there. Use a fair bit of moisture. And the thing that I'm gonna wanna do next is just start working towards some of my neutral tones. You know, get this mask set up get some of these grays down towards the tail and the lower parts of the wing. And then that'll have me at a point where all the main shapes have been blocked in. And then I'll be able to kind of take a look at it and go, okay, well, where can I adjust values to kind of the next stage? So let's just give this another dry here so I can, you know, confidently go in here and add some paint without worrying about it leaking everywhere. So try this up. Not the right button. There it is.
Okay, there we go. Give that a little check. Kind of a small thing, but worth mentioning, right? Whenever I'm checking the, um, <clears throat> whenever I'm checking the, the moisture level on the paper, don't use your fingertips. Use like the edge of your hand or the back of a knuckle, uh, just because you can accumulate some oils on the tips of your fingers. Uh, and if you kind of get that down into your painting, it can have an effect on the overall wash. I mean, something like this where I'm going to be going with darker values and I'm getting some texture in there, maybe a fingerprint or two might not be too bad. But, you know, if you're painting like a landscape and you want a nice clean blue spring sky or something like that, you probably don't want a fingerprint, an oily fingerprint left behind. So just avoid uh, putting your fingers on the paper. So. Um, okay, so let's go in here. So we've got our two main values, right? So the overall colors of this bird have been sort of worked out, right? We've got our blue, we've got our orange. So we've got this nice complementary harmony going on. I have managed to pull a little bit value up closer to the front edge of the wing, which makes sense, right? With the lights coming around, I kept the top a little bit lighter. Um, I've taken this blue and I used a bit of dark neutral and a bit more dark neutral into it. So it's more of a gray, gray blue um, in this beak right now, which I think is gonna work a little bit better. And it differentiates it from the body, right? If I look and stick to the reference, this is way more similar to here, but for my painting, I kind of want them to be a little bit dissimilar. I don't want to all of a sudden put like pink in here. For example, that wrong. But I just don't want it to be the same. I want some differentiation. So I'm gonna add some water to this last puddle on the right here, which you know at the beginning was just some leftover dark neutral. Now one thing with the dark neutral is it shifts an awful lot when it dries, um, like 20% lighter as it dries. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, whenever I start using dark neutral to kind of build up some value like I'm about to do, I don't worry about the fact that I might have to go over it one or two times. Three, four, it happened. Um, so I will just start with a lighter value and just kind of see how that looks. I think that that's going to work. And I'm going to just turn this on its edge a little bit. Now, when it gets to the, the tail area here, I'm going to basically bring a value up along to the wing edge. I'm gonna go start in the tail, we'll come up here a little bit and then we'll come down. Uh, and I think it'd be, I'm, I almost wanna go a little bit lighter. So I'm gonna take a little bit of water and just lighten it up. Just You may have noticed I will often just go up to this little towel above here. And that's just an attempt to control some of the moisture in the tip of my brush. So I'm not just going in with a really full loaded brush. Gives me a little bit more control. And I'm thinking about texture. I'm thinking about some of the little shapes that are in here. Uh, I'm not trying to paint specific lines, but I'm just kind of moving the brush in the direction that these primary feathers are moving. So I end up with some little breaks in the line that work well for what I want to do. So I just get a few marks in there. I want this to be just a little bit softer. There. And then grab a little bit more and we'll just kind of keep on moving down. And 
then what I can actually do is just grab a little bit of thick dark neutral. And I'm just going to, while this is wet, I've just kind of painted in here recently. I'm just going to drop a bit more pigment down along the bottom here. a little so it just starts bringing up some of that value along the lower edge Just saw a question. I'm not seeing everything because I'm, you know, looking down at my painting. But I just saw a question that says, "Do I generally use um, one brush for uh, the entire painting?" Uh, not, not necessarily. Um, it really just kind of depends on what what feels right. Um, I mean, I have a whole bunch of brushes just kind of sitting off to the side, but I just kind of look at the if you get fairly comfortable with moisture control using something like a towel like so, you'd be surprised at the amount of time you don't need to spend changing brushes because I can, you know, really load this brush up with a ton of paint and use it as a brush that, you know, behaves um, larger than it. Or I can really just control the moisture right out of it and Paint real small little details with it as well. So all comes down to the moisture control of the brush. Which I mean, I wish I knew this when I first started acquiring art materials. Didn't. Oh, I've got lots of brushes of lots of different sizes, and now you know all I really use are uh, eight and a ten. I mean eight and a twelve. And a couple small things where it's just a small brush, a little one that I've been using for like the eye area here. It's just, I can't really get that sort of control. And often I'll kind of stop. I'll have a, one of these, like this brush will be loaded with paint and I can just lay it down and then pick up the small brush. And I don't have to worry about cleaning the eight and I can finish off a little detail and then just go right back to the bigger brush. Oh, 100 well i mean you can do it with uh with a combination of two brushes right like i think one of the more traditional ways to do that sort of splattering is to use a couple of brushes and just bang but you don't have as much fine control over it you can certainly do things like put paper down and you know block off an area and then do that kind of thing but i think one of the things for me is um you know, whatever brush you're using, especially with the softer watercolor brushes, you get a little bit of recoil. And I tend to just lean right over when I would do this sort of technique. And so while a bunch of the paint goes down onto the paper or water, uh, I get another percentage of it goes the other way, which generally means my face. So um, I don't really like that technique too much. But with the fan brush, and I use a long handled um, hog hair, Fan brush that I've just kind of chopped up with a pair of scissors. The long handled fan brush, I can just plant that right in the palm of my hand there and just wrap my hand around it. And because of the length, I just have to tap it firmly and it generates enough torque out of the tip that it just kind of releases right into the area that I want it to go. Um, so. Yeah, no, 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 no problem at all. I'm here to share, right? <laughs> okay, so as you can see, I have built up a little bit of 
value into the wing area. I just did a straight run of that mixture of neutral tint along here. But what I'm looking for is just kind of a variation in values along here. I'm not going to worry about a lot of little details that are up here. If you look at the reference, there's a little bit of blue and there's lots of tiny little white things. So I left a few little white marks. It's all I'm really after. I don't want to get too carried away. Remember from the beginning, my goal is to focus on this area. So why spend an inordinate amount of time back here? Now that's for me in the way that I like to paint, right? If you are like a art illustrator and you want to do a whole bunch of detail, um, then you know, have at it, right? You just build up that area a little bit more. It's all good. It's just not really what, what I'm looking to do. I just enjoy painting birds. I get a lot of, a lot of enjoyment out of it. Um, I don't, you know, when people want to put my birds up in their home, that's awesome. But and I'm certainly not looking to create a painting of a bird where someone's going to go out into the field with this to identify whatever bird it is. I don't know if that would be like a real cumbersome thing to just run around with a whole collection of watercolor paintings. Go field guide. Anyways, um, so we're looking pretty good. Um, I'm going to just do one little thing under the bottom of the beak here. I'm just going to take a little bit of this value. Actually, what I'm going to do is not bottom of the beak. I'm going to put a little bit of neutral tint. Very light. Just into some of these little markings. Underneath the beak here. Very pale. And I'm not going to let that sit for long because I want to come right back in. And I just want to soften all that. And that just gives a little bit of texture in the face area, right? So, you know, you could do a lot of things. You often hear contrast as a way of directing the eye. You know, lights and darks tend to be fairly arresting. That's why catch lights and eyes are a really good thing because people put a little sparkle. Um, but you can do the same thing with kind of detail. Like in the areas where I tend to put a little bit more detail and focus, it tends to be where the eye sort of goes a little bit more strongly. It's like, oh, look at all that stuff to look at. So it's another way that we can direct the viewer. With a damp brush, right? If you want to soften, right? If you're if you're going anything on dry, you're going to get a hard edge. You you need moisture to get any form of a soft edge. So I'm not going to go in with a brush right out of the bucket that's full of water. I will always go and just remove some of that water from my brush. So I just have a it's a wet damp brush. I'm not gonna I can flick it and there's not gonna well, I got a little bit of water out of it there, but Generally, I'll just get most of it out, so it's just damp. And then I'll use that to soften. You don't want it full of water, because if you're trying to soften an area that you've recently painted and you have excess water in your brush, it, you run the risk of it flowing back into what you're softening, and then you'll get the cauliflowers and things like that, which you know aren't a bad thing if you want that texture in your painting. So if you want to do it intentionally, it's a good thing. But if you don't want it, you have to control the moisture in your brush. There's really no way around it. Hopefully Thank that, you. Hopefully that answered the question. And so uh, I was using a Pentel a graph gear, or I use the Pentel P205. They're both uh, 0.5 as far as the size of the lead. Um, though I do change the lead. When you buy these things, they come with HB lead. I tend to prefer drawing and sketching with 2B lead. Unless I'm really getting into a pencil drawing, then I'll use a range of uh, lead softness. Is, is, say that word. But, um, you know, I'll use a range of different leads. But just for sketching, if I'm just going to throw one pencil in my bag and go away, it's going to be a 2B. 
All right, so I wanna make sure that this is all dry. We're kind of moving into just finishing off some values here. We're basically almost done, so. Okay, so let's take a look here. What needs to be a little bit stronger? So this is where we kind of assess, right? We kind of look, okay, this is a little bit lighter. This is a little bit stronger. That's kind of the movement that I generally want. This is a little bit darker here. So I do like that overall movement. But then we come up to this area of the mask around the head and it feels distinctly lighter. So this progression of value isn't really happening for me in this particular area. So if I'm going to correct anything right out of the gates, I'm going to address, you know, a, the bigger issues rather than looking at, you know, oh, this could be a little bit more or I could do a little bit more here. I'm just thinking about the main progression. That's what I'll fix first. And this is just something that I've just kind of learned behavior over the years um, because I can get fixated on other things and think that that needs to be fixed. And I'll just try to solve all the problems right away. But sometimes if you just focus on the big ones, some of the smaller issues have a way of writing themselves. And I actually don't even end up needing to do some of the things. In fact, I will regret fixing some of the smaller things that seemed really important to me at the time. So, I just like to stick to the big problems. So the main big problem for me right now is this area. So it's lightened up quite a bit. So I'm just gonna kind of go over it and bring up a little bit more value. And I'm just using the eight in here. It'll be a little bit easier with a smaller brush, but it's fine. I will probably brush just to go around the eye there. So it's also a really good idea. When you look at something like I just did and kind of go, okay, I think I need some value here and bring this area up that as you do it, actually take the time while you're painting to appreciate the change you're making just do it because it's like oh, I think you know I need to do it or you're you know watching this video and going well Ian did it so I have to do it if you're not really looking at your painting as it's developing and thinking about well why am I doing this what's it adding you're not really learning why you should do it in the first place you're just kind of doing for doing sake so and when you think that way as you're doing it, it becomes more of a learned behavior that it's easier to recall in future paintings. No, no white. I used to use, well, I still keep, I keep gouache around but I rarely use it in my watercolor paintings. If there's an emergency, then maybe. But I, I really decided, you know, at, at one point where it's like, okay, I'm just focusing on brush control. And if I have too many, if I have too many, I'm gonna use the word crutches. If I have too many crutches around, I'm gonna lean on them. So I just got rid of them as many as I could um even with drawing at one point i was like all right i'm not going to do any pencil drawing for a while and i just abandoned pencils i used to use rulers all the time i dropped all the rulers and i just drew with ink for months because you know just gonna risk it see how it went 
And when you went back to using, when I went back to using a pencil and still no, not using a ruler, just things just felt better, right? You gotta, you gotta step off that cliff at some point and just try something. Um, you know, it may end horribly, but you know, we got time, we'll time, we'll go back to the other ways or try a different way. So now you can feel a little bit more direction. As soon as this value came up around the eye, this feels a lot better to me. I got this nice subtle little movement around here. Now I would want to establish this because I have been thinking about putting a little bit more value in the lower area of the upper shoulder of the wing. And also I want a little bit more value along the tummy here. So, As long as your painting is dry, right? I can treat this just like it was fresh paper. I can do another wash on here and soften the edges. Now the trick is when you go on and do those types of techniques, right? I don't, I wanna be efficient. I want to be very quick. I wanna get the paint down and I wanna soften it quickly. And I do not wanna get super busy with my brushwork because if I get too busy, let too much moisture go on here and start working back and forth with the brush, I can lift the paint that's behind there. Don't want to do that. So very quickly, I will use my brush. I visualize where I want the paint to go, control the moisture so I'm not just going to put a big soupy mess on here. And then I'll just run along with a little bit of extra value, like so. And then very quickly, just clean my brush. And I will use this very shallow to the edge of my paper. And just soften what's there. And that just brings a little bit more value up into the under part of the wing. Now I'm just going to grab a little bit more paint and drop a bit more right along the edge here. Just to kind of bring that line out a little bit more. And because I like that so much, now I'm thinking about that lower part of the wing. Nailed it. <laughs> That's funny. Isn't there like a Netflix show or something like that? You like Pinterest challenges or something called Nailed It? Off topic. Okay, so now I'm into the uh, the blue, so ultramarine, my warm blue with a little bit of dark neutral, and I want to bring a little bit up around the bottom of this wing. So I'm going to kind of do the same thing. We're making desserts, right? Okay, I'm, I'm just seeing the chat. So I'm going to bring this up. I'm sorry that he's upside down, but I like to soften with my brush in my hand like this. So I just move the paper. Same thing when I'm drawing. If I want to draw vertical lines and things like that, I kind of have the way that I like to draw them. So I'll just move the paper wherever I want it. No shame in that, right? I hope. Um, I think this is Fabriano Artistico. 140 pound cold press surface. I will use this. I will use arches and I will use Bao Hong or kind of the main, the main ones that I will use. So see how this little dark value, right? With this little value here, with these darks here, this is really kind of emphasize this line right down kind of heads and stops and then continues right on into the the head of the bird so. and for those that um you know care about such things uh 
I learned this past teaching season from a student who um, was very concerned about the use of animal products. Um, found out because I was using arches in that class that the um, sizing on arches paper is gelatin, thus using animal products. And they were a little bit sad about the fact that, um, and I didn't know, so he wasn't, he wasn't upset with me. But I was like, okay, well, are there alternatives um, for people? And Fabriano Artistico, which was a paper that is a paper that I also use, is actually branded right on their paper as cruelty free. They don't use any animal products at all in their sizing. That's a neat little thing to know. I'm just adding a little bit more value around the front there. I uh, just looked up, saw what mixing wells am I using? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. If you're referring to the palette, this is a palette that uh, I had made by a uh, gentleman in the UK. So I'm just putting a little bit of dark there and then I'm cleaning my brush and I'm just going to soften this out. I don't want it just to be all the same all the way through. So I'm just going to leave it darker, closer to the eye and the front of the beak. Putting a little bit of value in there. So look at that little nut hatch. Okay. So, a couple things to finish off here, and then he'll be done. Um, not the palette, but the actual place I put the paint water. Yeah, that's the palette. This is. Okay, let me give this a dry. Okay, so I just kind of applied the hair dryer to this front area here because this is the only area that I really have left to do any significant amount of work in. So uh, before I kind of go in, now would be the time that I would consider going in and finishing off any details. Um, I'm happy with the values. I did these little adjustments along here and at the front of the eye. I think that just kind of makes the values feel a little bit better. Uh, I'd seen someone ask something about dry brush for feathers. I don't generally paint feathers. Um, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not too into, you know, getting too detailed about everything. There's lots of little tiny feathery lines and things like that. Um, I think that a lot of the information is, you know, given to the viewer by the very nature of what this thing is, right? shape looks very bird-like oh it's got a beak that's kind of a birdie kind of thing to have this looks like a wing that's a very birdie thing to have at that point it's just kind of like um yeah that's probably all feathers i don't really need to go in there and and paint all the tiny little feathers i will go out the edge here and leave little wisps for a little texture along the edge um, and I'll probably do a couple little things in and around here just to get a little bit of extra detail, if you will. Um, but I don't do too much with anything else. Um, so what I will do now is just kind of go into the eye. Um, I'll use a pastel pencil. Um, I keep that one layer of the brown in the... Uh, I also saw something earlier about the image. And when this painting's done, I will photograph it and put it up to my Instagram account. So, which if you're looking at the bottom of my um, screen there, you can see that's the link to my Patreon page, which I do monthly demos on there. 
always do a monthly demo on there, a monthly live stream. I go live. Sometimes I paint a bird. Sometimes I've done an octopus. I've painted a bunch of different stuff. Um, last little while. And then I do like a live stream on there. And then I have like a bunch of different tiers on there. So I have like basic tier where you can sit there and watch the live streams. And then the next tier, I take all those live streams and I record them and I put them up so people can watch them whenever they want. And also in that tier, I put all my reference images up in there. I take photographs of my line drawings. I put those up in there. Um, it's really quite cool. I will, uh, I will photograph this though, and I will post this up onto my Instagram. So Ian DeHoge Art, there the address on the Patreon. You can just type Ian DeHoge Art into Instagram and that will get you my. So I just put a little bit of um, pastel pencil in the top and then I just soften it with a little bit of a blending snuff. Okay? Just to darken the top part of the eye and just leave a little bit of light in the bottom. And if I want it to be a little bit darker, then I just go in with a black and we'll just darken that a little bit more. And I just do it right along the top edge. I don't do too much because at this size of painting, um, I don't have a lot of real estate. So I'm doing a bigger, like a half sheet version of this bird, which I've done. Um, then I have a lot of room to work with. And I will actually do focus on trying to get a little bit more detail and definition around the eye. Amy Tan. Yeah. Well, okay. Yes. And another thing. Um, the pastel blended has a more velvety look in the overall painting. Um, and I have said that one of the things that I'm often trying to do is kind of, you know, lead towards the, the face. And so having that sort of unique velvety texture that's not very watercolory is a, just another little discerning element in that facial area that I think kind of sets it apart. Um, so I'd seen someone mention uh, Amy Tan. Um, yeah, she has gotten into some, some uh, nature sketching quite a bit. And I'm actually going to be in um, so Wild Wonder is a nature journaling organization um, started by John Muir Laws, who is a great bird illustrator, fantastic and fantastic nature illustrator, and does an annual Wild Wonder nature journaling conference. And um, very excited to say that I'm going to be one of their speakers this September. So if you follow me on Instagram, keep a look out for that. Just sent me the date the other day so recently that I haven't um, committed it to memory. Otherwise, I'd tell you what it is right now. That's going to be in September. I'll be doing something similar to this, but a different bird. Loose watercolor birds. So like this and you want more well i mean of course you can go to patreon and got a bunch of birds on there too doing more but also at the wild wonder conference i'm just using a little bit of black pastel in the beak here and i'm just gonna just use this to just play with some value in the beak and soften it up And it just kind of gives a slightly different value. And when I have some excess pastel just kind of sitting on the blending stump, I can just use it to dirty up, for lack of a better term, some other areas.
Oh, there we go. Someone just put that on there, September 13th to the 17th. That's right. And uh, yes, you can get pastel pencils from this. Um, these are Conte Aperi. Black and like a burnt umber. What's the permanence? Um, permanent, I guess, it's like pastel. So, uh, you just kind of want to watch it. Um, it will rub, right? So once your painting's behind glass, that's really not going to be that big a deal. Okay. So there we go. There's a little, uh, little nut hatch. We've got a nice little bit of value on there, right along this core area, a little bit of detail along the edge of the wing. So we can really feel that these primaries are there, but most of the value and the attention to detail sits in and around this area. So we got this nice little flow through here. We got this nice complimentary palette balancing on either side there. Um, so I'm pretty happy. It looks very, you know, I haven't finished this painting. I look at it and I go, well, that doesn't look like a nut hatch at all. I mean, that's generally what, how I determine whether a painting is a success or not. If I finish it and it doesn't look like the bird that I started painting, then I'm in trouble. But as long as it looks like it, then, you know, it's a success. And if it's not perfect, it's not the masterpiece that I was hoping for, then, you know, as long as I've learned something along the way, it's really for me what watercolor is about it's not something i've been painting for a long time and i learn something every time i do a painting and it's that aspect that keeps me coming back to this medium i could paint this bird a number of times and every time it's going to come out slightly different it's one of the beauties of you know this medium watercolor uh, so yeah, I, I love it. Hopefully you enjoyed this demo. I appreciate y'all being here. I mean, there were a lot of people. Like At one point, there was over 220 people here. So thank you all for, for coming and coming from, from all over. Um, so yeah, there's a nut hatch in kind of a loose style, right? Um, Pamela, do you have any questions? I don't really know what to say now, so... Yeah, I mean, see, I, I, growing up, you know, my mom liked Bateman and Lansdowne and, you know, very, very accomplished painters. And, you know, you look at Bateman's work and it's so detailed. Um, it's, it's incredible that, you know, when I kind of started, I have really was focused on landscapes and streetscapes for, for quite some time. And, and birds were, for lack of a better term, my dirty little secret. Um, it was actually at a demo I was doing for Opus in Coquitlam and I had some sketchbooks with me and people were going through my sketchbooks and had found a bunch of the birds in them. And they were like, Oh, what's that? Um, that I was like, Oh, people like this. <laughs> it's not just me. So, uh, next thing you know, I start teaching people how to paint birds. Um, and the way that I, you know, have been doing it is just been like this. You know, I, I, my thought process is kind of like, well, I'm no Bateman. So why am I going to try and do that? I just kind of started doing them this way. And then at one point, it was like, okay, I actually kind of thought about it. Well, I could put feet in. And there was a point where I, where I sort of did. Um, uh, Merci, Rosetta. Uh, sorry, I just saw a comment. I should stop looking at that thing. Um, and, I, you know, you put the foot in and then like okay you put a foot in and then the next question someone's gonna ask is like well what's it standing on and it's like oh okay well now i gotta add that and then once you add that and it's like okay well where is it and then maybe i need to add some background right so it just turns in it just domino effect just turns into a whole other thing um so by just doing them this way i can really just focus on the form of the bird the shape of the bird the colors patterns textures values things that i'm i'm more interested in um so and you know all the information and 
Yeah, this is all your fault. <laughs> I uh, I was just kind of quietly painting, um, and uh, I got contacted by Opus Coquitlam actually again, and it was like, hey, um, you know, we like what you're doing on Instagram. Will you come do a demo? And I responded, oh hell no. Um, they're like, well, you know. Just try it. Um, and so I, I relented and was like, all right, well, I'll try anything once. So I did. And people were very kind. Um, and it wasn't long after that that I got contacted by a bunch of other opi. I don't know. Is that plural for opus? I don't know. But I've, I've, I don't know. So I've been to, I think, every store except Kelowna which um, I think I was hoping to get to Kelowna, and then that's when the pandemic happened. Oh. Well. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks again. And for hey, Violet, I just saw Violet too. Yes, I've been to South Surrey White Rock Art Society a bunch of times. Sorry, I'm, re I'm reading the comments again. Read you. <laughs> this is when the love. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, if you know, say hi on Instagram if you're there. And if you, you know, like what you're kind of seeing here, uh, like I mentioned, I do monthly live streams on Patreon as well as teaching locally. Um, so you can check out Patreon if you, if you wish. You can also get to that link through my Instagram as well. Um, but yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hope you learned at least one thing today. Um, that would mean the world to me. So happy painting. <laughs>